We're going to be in the book of Psalms today, chapter 18. We will also be in Matthew later, just for a little while. But we're going to be camping out in the book of Psalms, chapter 18. We're going to look at the first 10 verses. Even though I'll be referencing some of the other verses in that uh, psalm. Uh, psalm 18, first 10 verses. That should be an easy one to find. Uh, if you're there, say amen. 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 Let's see what God's Word has to say to us this morning. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. The pangs of death surround me. And the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Shao surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundation of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. I tell you, that's a psalm of David. That's one of the psalms that David wrote. As we look at part, this is week two of the sermon series, Simple is Profound. As we look at part of the life of David, I just so relate to David. Because so many times God used him greatly. And, and, and he always saw, seemed to seek after God. But yet there were times he messed up too. We all know about that too. He just messed up bad many times. But as I, as I look at David... He went through many seasons of his life, as we see in the scriptures. We know a lot about David. There's a lot of things that have happened to him. He had highs, he had lows, he had all the things that we have in our life. Now, you know, the scripture says that David was the apple of God's eye. That means the very center. Now, you think that because you're the apple of God's eye, you're the anointed of God, which David was, that everything comes easy. We, when we look at the life of David, we see it's not easy. Just because you find favor with God and you're saved, it doesn't mean everything is going to be easy. I found it just to be the opposite sometimes. When you try to do the right thing, it's harder than living the other way. Trying to do the right thing is, can be difficult. I, I heard there's no saying to go around that says, uh, you know, being a Christian ain't for sissies. And that's the truth. Now the Psalms, many people are not really sure what the Psalms are. I think Psalms, if I had to pick a uh, scripture that was my favorite, I would I got a lot of favorites, but I would say the Psalms are mine. Because there's so much wisdom there. There's so much emotion. There's so much depth. There's depth. There's so much passion there. You know, I, I just don't want to read God's word. I don't want to have a relationship with God like I'm taking medicine. You know, I want to have a passionate relationship with God. And that's what I feel like the Psalms give me. The Psalms, if you, from the Greek translation, basically means instrumental music. So a lot of times, you know, when you're reading these, remember these, a lot of these are just songs. They're poetry. They're all these things. There's so much more. They come from deep inside when somebody wrote these. It means so much more, it does to me anyway. There are Psalms of praise. There are Psalms of lament. There are Psalms of thanksgiving. They are used to cultivate a deeper relationship with God, whatever it is. Whatever gets you a deeper relationship with God, that's what you need to do. Many times we try to say, well, what, do, what does this person do? What do you do? You can't do any of that. You've got to do what works for you. You know, whatever gets you closer to God, that's what's going to work for you. The unifying theme of Psalms, it's pretty simple. What it, what it is, it's about God and us as individuals and our relationship with him. If you were to read into that, that's basically what it is. We make a lot of these scriptures and God 
everything about God, we make it way more complicated than it has to be. Simple is profound. I, I don't like things complicated. You know, I'm a simple kind of guy. It doesn't take much to make me happy. You know? So, I mean, I like things simple in life. I don't like drama. I don't like anything. I don't like chaos. I don't like any of that stuff. I can do with any of that, out with that. But I, as I've said many times, the Psalms, everybody thinks David wrote all the Psalms. He did not write all of them. He wrote the vast majority of them. But see, you've got to remember, when you have a heart for God, you know, you're going to see something. You ever see, meet somebody, and they just, you know, you can just feel the presence of God on them. Yeah, maybe you don't even know that person, but you can just feel the presence. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to ask. But that's, well, how do you know? Sometimes you just know. You just know some things in life. Some people say, I remember some people want an explanation for everything. Some things you can't explain. And I can't, I can't explain God. No matter how many words I put out there, they're not adequate to explain God. You, you just can't do it. Or I can't anyway. I've never seemed to be able to come around to that. David had a heart for God, even though he messed up a lot of times. But he had a heart for God. He wouldn't have been called the apple of God's eye for no reason. Psalm 18 was one of David's, David's favorite psalms. <laughs> he would sing whenever God delivered him from his enemies. I don't know about you, but when I come out on the other side of something difficult in my life, now I don't actually sing, but I feel like singing. <laughs> You know, and everybody else say, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> well, you don't want me up here singing. There's a reason I'm not up there. There's a, there's a reason. I don't have that gift. But, my, but I feel like singing. You know what? When you've been in something difficult and you finally break through that other side, I'm telling you, your spirit just feels like a release. You feel like singing because you've got the victory now. I don't know. Come on. Anybody amen me here? We didn't know funeral. Come on. Somebody yeah. talk to me. All right, I'm going to amen myself. You know I'll do it. <laughs> this psalm, amen. Psalm 18, is recorded elsewhere in the Bible. King David also sang this same psalm later in his life after the rebellion of his own son, Absalom. <clears throat> he sang this psalm. And think about the scripture we just read. David had been on the run. He wasn't king yet. He'd been on the run from King Saul for 10 years. David, I mean, King Saul had it out for him too. I mean, he had all the authority and the power to do it. He was trying to take David's life. David hadn't done anything wrong to him. It was Saul's own mentality, his jealousy, and all these things that had done it. David didn't do anything to him. David was one of his best uh, adversaries. But somehow, some way, King Saul became jealous of him because somebody else got notoriety besides him. He wanted to take his life. But at this point in the Scriptures, King Saul was now dead. Not because of David. David didn't retaliate. It's, oh, you want to take me out? Well, we'll see. You know, I'm going to take you out instead. That, that's not what happened. He was dead from an enemy attack and King Saul was now. What did David do? This says a lot about David to me. I know David messed up a lot, but this says a lot about it. Somebody who was trying to take his life for 10 years, he's, what, what, what did he do? He could have gloated and said, finally, finally, that, that, I am so glad that, you know, I mean, he could have said a thousand things. That's, that, that's not what he said. He had words of praise. That's what this, that's what this he had words of praise. He, didn't pray. he wasn't praising God because Saul was dead. He was praising God because God had preserved him these ten years. You see, your outlook is going to make a big difference. How you look at life, how you look at God. It's going to change everything. A lot of times, many times, people have problems simply because they're looking at things the wrong way. You're not looking at what God did. You're looking at all the problems that you had. After all these years, he praises God. Now, let's think about it. After all that, that, that he had been through, what if you put yourself in his shoes? Would you have been praising God or would you become angry? I've got angry over nonsense before. We've all had it. It got the best of it. We were looking at things the wrong way. We've gotten angry over things that really didn't matter. 
I believe the difference is, is how you look at life. How you look at God. You know, many of us go through the same things, but how we come out the other side is much different on us. How you come out the other side. I can see two people go through almost the exact same thing. One person will come out praising God and the other one will come out angry and want nothing to do with God afterwards. Your outlook on life is going to make a big difference. It's going to determine the trajectory of your life, your outlook on God, and outlook on this life. Many of us go through the same thing. We think we're the only ones. Nobody understands anything that I'm going through. I assure you God has seen it all. He, he, he's never missed a thing. All the hidden things, all the difficult things, all the trouble you've had in this life, God saw it all. We can choose to be a victim or a victor. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to be a victim. Somebody might have tended me to be a victim, but I choose victory. And if you choose to be a victim, don't blame it on somebody else. And certainly don't blame it on God because you chose it. You chose it. As I see it, David's psalm here, Psalm 18, there are many keys here. I mean, you, I could preach out of this for months, this one, this one psalm. There are so many things here. Some of the keys are, you know, David was passionate about the Lord. He wasn't merely interested one person on fire for God is better than 40 merely interested. Amen. Give me one person on fire for God. Watch how things change. Many times, you know what? People are just merely interested. That's all, that's all they're interested in. It's just, you know, um, I want to be a good person. I, you know, I, I tell you, I hear among God's people so many times, how many Christians, they, they, it's not that they want to be closer to God. They want to know how much they can get away with and still get to heaven. Come on now. I ain't going to get many amens on that kind of stuff. <laughs> David called upon the Lord. He was passionate about the Lord. He called upon the Lord. I, I like it if you, would, if you would read down in the Scripture. I didn't read the whole psalm. I wasn't going to read all that to you. But in, down in some of the other verses, it said, the Lord thundered. In other words, he responded. He seen David's distress. And, he, and, and David was uh, giving him praise. The Lord responded. You know, the Lord does respond, right? It says he came down, he had, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, rode on the wings of the chair. That means he, you know, he sees our distress. The Lord supported him. The Lord re rewarded him for faithfulness. Faithfulness is hard to find nowadays. Faithfulness is hard to find. God strengthened him. God gave him the victory. But what did David do? He praised God. Many times God has seen us through so many things and what do we do? We don't come back and give Him the praise for what He's done. Many times we repeat the cycles of all the things we've learned in life. You don't understand how I was raised, Pastor. No, I don't. I don't know what you've been through. But I assure you God has seen it all. There's a purpose and a plan for everything. I don't always understand it. I don't always see it. You ever feel like in life sometimes like you're fighting against the wind? And what are you going to do? Shadow box the wind? I mean, what are you going to do? How, how's that going to work out for you? It's not going to work out very good at all. You know, if you're just fighting against the wind, what is that? that's, not, that's just not going to work out. It just seems like everything's a struggle sometimes. I have to get it through my head that sometimes the choices that I'm making, that's what's making my life miserable. And I can change that. There's a lot of things in this world I don't have control of, but my choices I do. I, can, I have control of those choices. Maybe that's what's making me miserable. Can I change if I want to? Only if I want to. I can change if I want to. It's God's desire to see my life better and change, but I've got to have a desire to if I want to. If you don't want to, you're going to continue to be a victim. You're just going to continue to do that. You've got to make the choice. Now I'm going to share something here with you. This is going to be hard to do. Look in the mirror and admit out loud. Just don't say it to yourself. Admit out loud. When you go home or whatever, when you're having something going on, look in the mirror and say, it's me, Lord. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. 
And I know there's something going on inside of me and I don't understand how I'm feeling and I don't even understand myself sometimes. But I know something's got to change and I know it's me. I know it's not you. I know you have my best interest and I don't understand what's happening to me right now. But it's me, Lord. Do the things that God shows you to do. Ask for forgiveness. Don't be so stubborn and admit that you're never wrong or you've never sinned or whatever's going on in your life. Ask for forgiveness. And this one here, I, I have I have a trouble with this one too at times. Forgive others that have hurt you. You don't want to forgive them. Or sometimes I don't want to forgive them. I want to be mad with them. I don't want to forget them. I forgive them, I should say. Yeah, I like to forget them, but <laughs> but. Forgive others that have hurt you. I don't want to forgive them sometimes. What do you want to do? Yeah, you want to let them have it, don't you? Oh, you want to give it to them. Oh, I'm going to let them. I'm going to burn them to the ground. There's going to be nothing left of them. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Pray unceasingly. And something here that's something we often forget is, repeat often is necessary. I find it's more necessary sometimes than others in life. Sometimes, you know, I, 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 I mean, I have really have to seek the Lord more often. You know, sometimes when I'm going through something, you know, not that I don't seek Him any other time, but I'm just telling you, you ever notice when you're going through something, you seem to be more passionate about your prayers? Amen. Yeah. If you want a better life, a joyful life, a God-blessed life, not only do you got to die to yourself, but you got to die to your past. Your past. Yes, all that stuff. All that stuff. You've got to die to your past. You can't go back and change a thing. Not one thing. Worrying, stressing, and thinking about it. Reliving those moments. You say, I'm not worried about those moments. Then why do you keep reliving them? If they weren't important to you. They happened years ago, but yet you right there in that very moment, you can quote each word that was said by you and maybe the other person. You know exactly what was said, but you say it doesn't hurt you none. Uh-huh. Don't tell me. Go tell somebody else that stuff. You know, David, he could have got bitter, but he got better. Why? Because he chose to. He chose to. God had seen him through ten years of chaos. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't done anything wrong. But see, God was preparing David for something even greater. Something that maybe, you know, that's what God, maybe God's doing in your life. You don't see it right now. What in the world could God be preparing for me? I don't know that. I can't give you that answer. I'm a pastor. I'm not a prophet. But I'm going to tell you this. God has a greater plan. We can't always see it. But sometimes we get in our own way because our outlook clouds everything up and you can't really see what God is doing. I'm going to give you some words of wisdom that were given to me one time. I didn't really like him when he told them to me either. I didn't want to take the words of wisdom. I wanted to give him something else. <laughs> when I, I was, I don't know, doing whatever, person told me, he says, I'm getting ready to give you a few, few words of wisdom. I'm like, uh-huh, what's that? You know, I'm, I'm ready. I didn't know what he was going to say. He just looked at me and said, suck it up, cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's all we got to do. We've got to stop making everything a big deal and just suck it up and move on in life. I know that's easier said, but you don't understand, Pastor. Get over yourself. No, I know, I'm not making light of anything that you've been through. But sometimes we just need to get over ourselves and move on. We just need to suck it up sometimes. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing the right thing, sometimes it's going to be hard. It was hard for David. He was the anointed of God. He was the apple of God's eye. It didn't come easy. He was the apple of God's eye. As King Saul pursued David many times, what did he do? He hid among the rocks. If you read the scripture, it was a rocky terrain. He would hide among the rocks. I thought, that's very smart. <laughs> All right, let me, I'll ask you this. In warfare, would it be smart to hide behind the rock or would you stand in front of it? If any of you are going to say in front of it, just remind me never to have you on my team. <laughs> I don't want you on my team because you're not going to be around long. If you want to stand in front of the rock, I'll be behind it. As David hit among the rocks, though, why did he do that? 
He did so because he knew his real help come from the Lord. The rock of his salvation. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, Jesus gives us some words here. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to, I'm going to re actually read it so it makes sense of where I'm going with this. Otherwise, it might not all come together. The book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 24, 27. I know some of you take notes. I'm going to read that quickly. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. <clears throat> but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. The reason I shared that scripture here as we move through this sermon, I just wanted to look, share a little brief story from my life. Uh, it was in September of 2003. Uh, at that time, Hurricane Isabel came through this area. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, remember that. We got some of it here in this area. A lot of it moved toward the western shore a little bit. But I remember down in the islands, like southern Dorchester County and all that, a lot of the islands, I mean, they got hammered. And I remember the company I was working for at that time, we had, they just had tons of accounts down there. And I remember working down there after all that devastation. You wouldn't believe the things that, that I saw. And, uh, and I just remember the devastation in that community and all the things. And I was down there for months trying to help put that stuff back together. But what I've seen is the devastation, yes, but i also seen at the people that I met. A lot of the people I met, how they handled things differently. They all went through the same thing. <laughs> they were devastated down there. Very few missed out on anything getting harmed. But how they handled it was much different. I could tell, and I didn't, certainly didn't ask them, I could tell the true believers. I could tell the difference in how they handled the situation. They'd been through the same thing, but I could just sense in their spirit. They knew that everything was going to be all right. Even though they had been through a terrible time, you just wouldn't believe what it did down there. Unbelievable. But how they handled it is much different. Two people can go through the same thing, but how they handle it is much different. The presence of the Lord made all the difference. Now, with it being Father's Day, I remember this quote when I was a young man. I remember hearing about it. I haven't actually heard it for years. I remember a couple quotes, but uh, when you go through something, it said, this is what separates the men from the boys. <clears throat> one I used to always hear, the contenders from the pretenders. That was a little bit later on. But what separates the men from the boys? In other words, what's real? Who's real? Who's the real deal? When your faith is going to be tested, and it will be, you're going to see who's real and who's not. You can't tell if your faith is real all the time unless it's been tested. How do you know? It's easy to be follow God when everything is falling in place. Well, how about when everything is falling apart? Do you still stay the course? Separate the men from the boys. Who's real and who ain't? When your faith is tested. When your faith is, t faith is tested, you're going to know whether it's real or not. Let me just say this. You better know uh, what your house, your spiritual house, is built on. As the scriptures that I just read, you better know what your spiritual house is is built on. Because everything, Jesus might have used parables uh, from earthly things so we could understand heavenly things. You better know what your faith is built on because it's going to be tested sooner or later. I can't tell you how many people that I've seen saved and they fall by the wayside as soon as something difficult comes their way. Evidently their faith wasn't real. Their faith wasn't real. You better know what your house is built on. You better know what your spiritual house is built on. I remember during Hurricane Isabel, when I went down to the islands, I saw water, the massive amount of water that came into that area, cut new channels through dry land. 
There was no channel there. It wasn't even water right up in that certain area. But it had cut channels now. And there was water. There was almost like a small river. There were streams, I mean, steadily flowing. I'm talking about 10, 15 feet wide. And I don't know how deep they were, but people were riding boats through it. So I'm streaming 5 to 10 feet deep at least. I don't know how deep they were. Had cut channels where there was none before from the massive amount of water. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? I saw a couple months later, after everything started, the water had gone down and everything was starting to get back to a normal way of life, I saw some people come into that area where, that, where I saw that channel cut through that uh, dry land. Uh, I don't know who it was. Somebody come in with some big equipment and stuff, and they filled in all that, that channel, what I call a channel. I don't know what it was. It was so big. But they had filled it all in just like it was never there, you know. And eventually, you know, I, I, we had a lot of counts, and I would go down there, and everything would just start growing back in. There's a reason I'm telling you this. I'm just not talking to hear myself talk. I don't like the sound of my own voice that much. <laughs> but as that land, and few, few, that land went back to normal, a few years later, guess what I saw? I saw a house being built right on top where that channel had been cut through during Hurricane Isabel. Now, the people must not have been from that area. I don't know I don't know who lived there or what. I don't know if the house is still there or not or what have you. It was being built right on top where that channel had been cut. I ask you, what do you think is going to happen if a major hurricane like Hurricane Isabel ever comes through again? You better know what your house is built on. You better know what your spiritual house is built on. You better know the foundation of it. Because the foundation is important. All the other stuff is what we enjoy many times. But you better make sure that foundation is built correctly. David had his foundation built correctly. Yes, he messed up. Yes, he outright sinned. But he knew that his foundation was built correctly. Because he always turned back to God even when he messed up. Know what your house is built on. Many times we don't realize the foundation we've set up. The single most important characteristic about David wasn't David. It was God. Amen. David believed in God. He thought about God. He imagined God. He addressed God and he prayed to God. The largest part of David's existence was not David himself. It was God. That's why he was the apple of God's eye. That's why God did great things through David. Simply because of his belief and his passion for God. Look at us as a nation. We as a nation are full of values. You say, what's wrong with values? Yeah, but we're a nation full of values, but we ain't got no morals as a nation anymore. Look at our nation. Anything goes. Right is wrong and wrong is right. How dare you say anything? You say, well, what's the difference between values and morals? Morals are a sense of right and wrong given by God, by the Holy Spirit. That, 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 there's a big difference. You say, well, values. Values are something that we just develop all on our own during our life. Somehow during our life, we develop these values. You know, it's like whatever you believe and you set as a standard, well, that's your values. That could be anything. Adolf Hitler had values, the wrong ones. Everybody has values. Everybody has values. But that doesn't mean they're the right ones. Morals are a big difference. The morals of our nation, I'm telling you, they have declined just in my lifetime. I mean dramatically. Dramatically. There's a lot of places I go and a lot of things I see I don't even recognize anymore. I think there's no way. And you can't listen to the crowd. Oh, this is whatever's popular. That must be what's right. Oh. My gosh, don't believe that. In 1939, Adolf Hitler was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh -huh, that was popular. Uh -huh. I think somebody missed, missed it somewhere, don't you? Yeah, that was popular. That, they said that, that was great. Uh -huh. Keep listening to the crowd and following the crowd. You're going to be with the crowd. The man, I don't know, here's a little interesting fact. It didn't really go with my sermon, but I like, I, I stumbled into that when I was studying. I'm like, it's just a little, little nugget here. The man, the man who founded the Nobel Peace Prize also invented dynamite. 
I have no idea. There's no correlation with my sermon at all. I just found that little nugget. I'm like, I gotta share that. I thought that was interesting. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know where that comes from, but uh, anyhow, simple is profound. Keep things simple. Don't make things complicated. You're making this way worse than it has to be. You're making it way harder than it has to be. Put God at the very center of your life and watch how God works. Amen. Put him at the center of your life. Just don't put him as an add-on. I'm telling you, come clean with God and just confess your sins to him and he will forgive you. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, what your last name is, and what your bank account looks like. God, God is... God is more interested in you as a person than I think you are sometimes. Amen. God has a great plan. I tell you, we've all messed up in life at times. Maybe that's where you're at right now. You know, maybe you got things going on in your life that don't belong there, and you and you, you have this feeling, and you're not sure how why you even feel like that. But I tell you, God has something greater than you can ever imagine. Amen. There are more things out here, I'm telling you, God sees things in you. Maybe you don't even see in your own self right this minute. 